Well, uh, I was 21. Pound was 72, 71 or 72. At that time, he had finished the section of the cantos, the part of the cantos called Section Rock Drill, and was working on <coughs> Los Cantares, 95 to 109. Uh, and he was, of course, involved in trying to get out of, out of uh, the funny farm, uh, more so than he usually had been in previous years. There was an incessant stream of visitors, uh, some of whom were interesting, some of whom were remarkable in other ways. Uh, but in particular, there was a female disciple, a couple of years older than I was, uh, with whom Pound, in fact, collaborated uh, in an anthology called Confucius to Come In at about that time. Uh, a young woman from Texas, uh, for whose, I don't know what, uplifting education, enlightenment, or what have you, uh, Pound undertook to read aloud and to footnote live or to make oral scolia on or something, the entirety of the cantos, the whole shooting match. Uh, and it was mostly through that that I sat. Uh, and it was indeed an extraordinary experience. Very much of modernist poetics rests upon an extension of the rhetorical figure called metonymy, the substitution of the part for the whole. The cantos is the supreme test of that. Uh, it is, it is the, the, the vastest of all metonymic works. In its failure, and I believe that as a, as a poem, as a whole work of art, it's a failure, as Pound believed, uh, it represents an incredible catastrophe within modernist poetics. It is one of the supreme attempts, and it is one of the supreme failures. It is an immense catastrophe. I don't think that it's possible, and I suppose here my uh, theoretical Marxist leaning uh, begin to emerge, at least, possible or feasible or advisable, to how well advisable, to bring off a project of those dimensions without a theory of history, in a word. And I don't think that Pound had one. I mean, thereby, unfortunately, also depends the anti-Semitism. Uh, Pound did not have a theory of history. He had a child's view of history. Uh, namely, that it was quite clear that everything was going downhill. Uh, and he set out to look for the culprit. And of course, he found the culprit, because when one sets out to look for the villain of the piece, one always finds that villain. Uh, and that villain, of course, uh, was not the Jew. Uh, that vill villain was, was a, a, a kind of, of, of recurrent uh, state of mind that Pan came to call usury. But I can also understand and sympathize with uh, how that came about, and I think that is, that is very sad. I mean, imagine the, the relatively young man, he was 30, 29, uh, in 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, uh, and had imagined uh, as only uh, a, a young romantic uh, from the Idaho wilderness, uh, but more, of course, from Philadelphia, uh, uh, enamored with European culture, could imagine a new renaissance. Uh, 
there with the making, an extraordinarily brilliant group of people, immensely gifted, faced with uh, what all of them perceive uh, in all the arts, at the very least, as a kind of tabula rasa. It was virtually impossible by the eve of the First World War, <coughs> even for Browning, let alone Algernon Charles Swinburne and Milton and Wordsworth, to have very much claim on, on the attention of the young poet, uh, any more than it was possible for Brahms to have an absolute claim on the attention of, of, of such a composer as Schoenberg, for instance, or what have you. Uh, the world, as it were, lay all before them. It seemed fairly clear what it was to be done. And then, of course, came the war. Uh, and in a sense that has been explained so often by so many people of that generation and a half a generation earlier, the world ended. Uh, as it had been slowly constructed from, let us say, the uh, the Renaissance through the Enlightenment and on into the period of the Industrial Revolution and the formation of the great empires of that period. That order ceased to exist. It seemed like a major collapse within Western civilization, and indeed it was. Most particularly, there was the personal loss of at least two uh, very close personal friends of Brown's, Henri Godier and, and T.E. Hume. Uh, of Godier, it would be premature, I think, to say very much. He was very young. Of, T. He, of, of Hume, on the other hand, uh, it is fair to say that, that critical thought of the philosophy of art sustained a very severe loss at that time. Uh, and what really happened to Pound after that time. He had been, before then, after all, an estate with flying hair, talking about Dante and so forth, was that he became a pacifist. Uh, and being the person he was, uh, as a pacifist, set out to retrieve the origins of war, which he considered, as we all consider, a supreme evil. He then uh, retrieve those origins as we now feel uh, incorrectly. I was an adolescent poet because it was the thing to be. Abstract expressionism, or let us say, uh, New York type painting, while I was in secondary school, uh, had begun to show real muscle, uh, the event or that moment, which was, as we know, quite extended, was still, still strikes me as extraordinary. It did then. Uh, and I tried off and on for a while uh, to be a painter uh, as well. But it uh, simply was not, a, as Gertrude Stein said to William Carlos Williams, my métier. Uh, I finally had to admit that it was something I just didn't like to do. I didn't like paint. Uh, I, I didn't uh, find any pleasure in, in smearing gooey substances over flat surfaces, which is, after all, what painters do in some way. I continue to maintain there has to be something deeply attractive in the idiot level of, what, of whatever you do, or it's impossible to sustain it. It could not be done, one had to be a millionaire and so forth. Uh, however, I did take the view that it could be done eventually, maybe, with luck in some way. I had no idea how. Nearest place to embark, uh, to acquire, say, a journeyman's knowledge of, of something that, that tended towards film, was the still photograph. 
try to be a still photographer in the late 50s and on into the middle 60s in New York was to live in a kind of vacuum. Uh, still photographers were people like Abaddon or something like that. In other words, they were people who corresponded more or less to Hollywood directors. Uh, they were beautiful people who took pictures of rather snotty looking other beautiful people uh, for the magazines. There was no photographic milieu, or virtually none, uh, that I thought could be taken seriously. And there was one very small gallery on East 10th Street. I don't remember what it was called. It was kind of two rooms painted white. It was very much a, a, a kind of coterie uh, situation. The photographs weren't very interesting. Uh, and a guy named Norbert Kleber, who lived under the stairs uh, uh, in the village and had a very long front hallway that led back into his uh, apartment, opened something called the Underground Gallery, which was his hallway. But that was it. The rest was the MoMA. Uh, and the MoMA was uh, then as it is now, uh, except that it was Steichen instead of Sarkovsky. Uh, and it was, you know, uh, the family of man instead of what have you, uh, the, the, the current product there. Uh, from the point of view of the museum, it was, it was a, uh, photographers were scarcely landed gentry any more than they are now. in my uh, then still perennial search for the father figure, opted for Weston, uh, more or less climbed the, uh, the, uh, the coconut tree of, of, of view camera uh, slash his own system stuff. I never had too much stomach for white, thank you. But, uh, uh, Having done that, I really couldn't very handily find my way down out of that tree. I didn't, I didn't really like uh, the work that I thought was my best work. I liked the stuff that I didn't like a lot more. There I was, uh, essentially having fallen among sculptors and painters in New York. And of, uh, among sculptors and painters who were my direct peers, and, and in a couple of cases at least school chums, Carl Andre and Frank Stella in particular, uh, who were in the in the nature of the thing uh, dogmatic anti-illusionists, and I found myself in the in the very peculiar and uncomfortable situation of being a committed illusionist. And of course, they had reason on their side, you see. Uh, I mean, they could uh, marshal not only their own arguments, which were excellent, but those of Venerable Clement Greenberg and so forth. Uh, uh, it left one very little room even for being a devil's advocate. Uh, because if anything, I felt myself not to be the advocate, but the devil himself. Eventually, what I found in making still photographs was that I was working not only in series or in sequences, uh, but was imagining um, sequences of photographs that were time-regulated. Uh, now, that's impossible to enforce. You have things up on a wall, and you would like to say someone now someone now go back uh, 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 to photograph number 13 and look at it for eight seconds, all right? Well, at that point, uh, within the work I was doing, uh, the, the vehicle more or less collapsed, and I was tossed out of it into, into film whether I wanted to or not. Then there was, there was some, some problem in my mind about 
uh, about trying to, to purge my own work, or at least my, uh, the internal uh, geometry of my frame, uh, of the still photograph. That process is, is still going on in Zoyng Vama. Now, I spent a long time, of course, uh, uh, theoretically paying my, my debts to still photography. Uh, and as at least one friend remarked, uh, the, the Western essay was, was, the, was the ritual murder of the father, which I, I then, of course, had to, uh, being a grown man, at least decently bury with my own hands. Uh, at the same time, I did, I did want to, to do Western the service of offering that body of work some criticism. Uh, some critical attention, uh, rather than lighting, you know, simply another another candle at the shrine of, of, uh, of Wildcat Canyon or something like that. I don't think that film and photography are two halves of something. Uh, my my general my sensation. Now, right now, is that they are both uh, parts of something for which we do not have a name uh, at the present time. It would be amusing to try to give it a name, uh, which thing, once it is fully constant will, I expect, finally constitute a, a, a kind of counter-machine uh, for the machine of language. That is to say, I, 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 I think that, uh, or I suspect, that the intellect uh, of the West, at least, has, has been struggling for quite some time to, to invent uh, a natural counterbalance for language as a way of accounting for the world, uh, a way of doing it through images. And it has done so uh, with its, with its, its usual uh, hysterical enthusiasm of productivity, uh, with its usual confidence and with its usual clumsiness. Uh, it's interesting to note, for instance, that uh, at least primitive, very, very primitive uh, cinemas predate the invention of photography. Uh, not by long, mind you, but by a few years. But it was quite some time before the two things united. Uh, the one in this case, as the tool of the other. I think it's very clear uh, from lots of reasons, I could give a few, that in the sense that we have had them <coughs> uh, since the 1830s and the 1890s, respectively, both still photography and film are uh, obsolete and they're going to vanish. I am in point of, of gratitude to quite a number of people uh, who first hacked their way through the jungles of, of independent film. And if there had not been uh, the the, the encouragement by example of quite a few people who had somehow managed to make films. Would you care to mention them? Sure, of course. Uh, glad to. First and foremost, Stan Brackage, without question. Uh, they didn't have to be films that I agreed with, you understand. Uh, but it was, it was nevertheless work of the first interest made with integrity and conviction. Uh, 
understand it had been done, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that Bracket did not agree with the price, uh, uh, by a, a, a classic gesture of seizing the means of production. Uh, but others as well, that's prolific and bracket very clearly. Uh, uh, Greer, uh, Kenneth Anger, I suppose, who had certainly persevered against extraordinary odds. Uh, most of all, uh, most of all, perhaps, in maintaining a, a, a space in which it was possible to entertain uh, the notion of, of, of making film independently, Jonas Mackis. Uh, I knew none of those people uh, at that time. I went to their screenings and so forth. There was then something uh, called the Cinematheque in New York, uh, which became a kind of hangout. Uh, I met other people uh, who were trying to make films. Joyce Whelan, Michael Snow, Ken Jacobs, uh, Ernie Gare after a while, although he was somewhat younger. Uh, later on, Paul Sheritz, who was at that time living in Baltimore. And there uh, existed at least for a time, and that time lasted for some years. In New York City, a, a, uh, a kind of constant contact among us. Uh, one might almost, almost venture to call it a, a, uh, uh, a sense of being united in some way, probably by the conviction that there should be, uh, that there should be good films. Uh, preferably films so good that they hadn't been made yet. Uh, that the intellectual space open to film had not entirely been preempted. Uh, there had to be some films uh, worth making or interesting to make that had not been made, uh, uh, even by the master of Rollinsville uh, or what have you. So that there was in that a kind of encouragement that, that uh, there was a dialogue, in a word, all right? There was a dialogue which had not existed in the Soviet Hollywood Just because it's possible to invent a narrative excuse for the way something presents itself doesn't, I think mean that it is narrative. I don't want to be stuck that closely to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, summary uh, uh, jocularities of the pentagram for conjuring the narrative. I mean, it was possible, for instance, to imagine the, the patterning of static uh, of white noise in Peter Kubelka's uh, Arnold Rayner as the, the breathing of a heavy and unwieldy man constantly running up and down stairs, which was Brackett's actual invention, by the way, to account for that. Uh, uh, at one time, I didn't have uh, very much difficulty uh, at a certain point in uh, suddenly detecting uh, in the kind of double bell curve uh, rate of change structure in Tony Conrad's flicker, a, a uh, thickening and thinning of density of event, let's say, which is very much like the abstract curve, let's say, of a Tolstoy, of a, of a not a Tolstoy, but maybe a... Uh, a short story by uh, Christ Almighty, Cherry Orchard, Uncle Vanya. Uh, Chekhov? Chekhov, yeah. Uh, uh, in which, for instance, one has a crisis in which uh, two people or a family are separated. 
all right? That's the main bell curve, typical checkoff situation. And then years later, a secondary uh, uh, peak of density of event in which they're reunited, after which the curve slopes back out to zero. So that, so that I, was, I, 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 was, I was seeing even there a kind of very rarefied trace uh, of a narrative structure, all right? About as much narrative, say, as there is hydrogen between galaxies or something like that. Quite a bit, in a word. Uh, but it detects, it, 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 it requires fairly delicate measuring instrument to detect it. Or you have to be, better yet it isn't, you just have to be tuned to the radio band that those hydrogen atoms are giving off, and then they're everywhere, okay? So if you start looking for narrative, out of curiosity, not as, as you know, a, 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 um, a disease, you know, some kind of unspeakable ancestral disease, tertiary syphilis, let's say, you say, uh, which was the, the uh, something like uh, what painters of my generation recoiled from when they detected an illusionist reference in an abstract painting. Okay, as if from someone who's, you know, whose nose has just fallen off or something like that from fright. Uh, but uh, uh, simply out of out of out of uh, out of some question as to whether it was escapable or not. You see, quite parallel to the question of, of whether or not uh, illusionist reference is absolutely escapable in painting. I contend that probably it's not as well. The issue never was, in my case, whether to make or not to make narrative films. Uh, I really, uh, uh, I, I contend, I mean, this is, this is simply, of course, the, uh, the voice of the author, another imperfect reader, uh, that all my work, and that includes, includes Magellan, includes even the portions of Magellan that have been made and released, are perverse or oblique narratives. Uh, I mean, it's possible, after all, to have a narrative account of, of, of a very brief period of time, for instance, all right, uh, and to expand that brief period of time until it's unrecognizable, and to and to fragment it, and to, to rearrange it, and so forth. Nevertheless, I think it's possible always, um, if it seems relevant to do so, uh, to expend that kind of diligence, and so forth, uh, to retrieve the standard of the rational narrative which accounts for it in some way or other, just as, as to take an example that is by no means extreme, uh, let me turn the tables and ask you if you believe, uh, for instance, uh, that last year at Marion Bob is a narrative film. Well, it is, of course. Um, Project for a Revolution in New York is a narrative book. Okay. It's, 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 it is a narrative fiction. Uh, in the case of both of them, uh, one is directed constantly towards an effort to retrieve uh, the, the uninflected account of the events as they actually were, whatever they were, because one perceives immediately that they're highly inflected. Uh, and the process of, of, of part of the process of seeing that Rene film uh, with its scenario by Rambouillet or reading that novel of Rambouillet uh, is a process of trying to retrieve uh, the actual events, whatever they were. All right. Then they may turn out to not be very interesting. The things I'm doing now are sometimes more and more, sometimes less narrative-like. 
uh, if you if you if you read uh, the Western text in, in October, then it's also possible that you read the issue of October following that, which has in it a group of seven short fictions called Mind Over Matter. Uh, all of which are, in a manner of speaking, narratives. Uh, and part of what those are about uh, is, the, is the, the relative transparency or, or opacity of the text to, uh, to the event. I mean, none of them are, are, are uh, very clearly uh, writing at degree zero or, or uh, Heaven help us! What uh, uh, Sartre commended in, in, in Camus, uh, écriture blanche, white writing. Uh, they they deviate in the direction of ultraviolet, I would say. Uh, in that regard, but narratives, indeed, they are uh, of some kind or another. The suggestion or utterance of of Brackages some years ago, which I find very problematical, uh, with which indeed I, I, I take issue, although not very extensively here. I remember his saying that uh, as an example of something in a film of his own, uh, a certain queen. Uh, sent forth a certain knight at the round table on a search for the Holy Grail. Uh, in the tale of that quest, one is, is, is uh, it is said on mythic ground. Uh, that is to say that that, uh, that story uh, seems to be the, the fleshed out general type of a class of stories. Uh, Stan then asserted on that occasion that if in a work of art, let us say a film, uh, uh, a woman says to a man, will you please go over there and get me a glass of water? Because it is a uh, it is a situation in which a woman sends a man on a journey for a container to fetch a container out of which one may drink. Uh, that situation, that moment, occupies the same mythic ground as the quest for the Grail, and then one has therefore a a, a blank reenactment of myth. It was a curious insight into what Brackage means by myth. Uh, I doubt it. Uh, aside from doubting it, I, I would just say very momentarily uh, that it is a curiously Jungian or kind of hyper Jungian view uh, of the thing one is looking at, that one understands it uh, according to whether its segments or components uh, constitute uh, a peg that fits more or less perfectly into a mythic whole of the proper shape. Uh, or that, you know, all human action, uh, however casual and ordinary, uh, is stamped out by a set of mythic cookie cutters that cut the cookies uh, of Oedipus or Agamemnon or what have you. Uh, I hope not, you see, because uh, that journey across the room, then, uh, to fetch the lady a glass of water uh, is not something that I want to make uh, because clearly there are too many sharp things uh, to fall on when one uh, stumbles over the footstool or something like that. And when one gets to the table uh, and finds that the table is, is not your regular table but a high altar suffused with violet light and defended by bats with baby faces and so forth. You, uh, uh, in, the, in the 
ordinary world are likely to say, well, fuck it, she doesn't get no water. <laughs> get your own goddamn cup. Uh, but I'm just not sure it's possible to, to, to live the quotidian life in, in, in terms of such high tone uh, quite all the time. People, I suppose, still think of computers as being enormous IBM mainframes uh, in, in rooms uh, blazing with fluorescent lights and full of roaring cabinets. Uh, but in fact, that's not true. They're little and cheap. Uh, I would say it's fair to say that within two years, uh, we will have intelligent toasters, for instance that will always brown your toast to exactly the way you want it, you understand, uh, because the, the giant computer of 20 years ago is now a little uh, integrated circuit. It's a little chip about the, that looks kind of like a porcelain band-aid and costs about $9. Uh, so if you want a really smart toaster, let alone a wearing blender, you understand, or an intelligent fr frying pan that will flip the omelet uh, at exactly the right time, you're going to have it. And in fact, of course, probably it's going to be difficult to have anything else uh, quite soon. And I suspect that that is going to have uh, consequences, social consequences, and consequences uh, with regard to the fate of the, of the counter machine of language, the image machine at least as, as, as far-reaching as, as video has, as television, broadcast television has, and probably more so eventually.